So. Ninety nine percent. All right, I'm going to hit live stream and we'll be live. So just a second with that. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session Habs in Lake Superior. I'd like to thank our session sponsor, the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, over the next hour, we'll be hearing from several presenters who will be speaking about the latest research around nearshore blooms of cyanobacteria appearing in Lake Superior waters between the Twin Ports and the Apostle Islands. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce our, our presenter, uh, Bob Sterner, who's, a who's the professor and director of the Large Lakes Observatory at UMD. Um, please remember to type your questions into the Q&A section and upvote questions that you want answered. And Bob, I'll turn it over to you, thanks. Thank you, Natalie. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Um, I have no idea how many are out there. I can't see too much in the way of um, video or feedback, but we've got my slide up there. Um, yeah, I'm Bob Sterner, University of Minnesota Duluth, um, just over the border from Wisconsin. And uh, myself and several colleagues are here today to talk to you about an emerging water quality issue in Lake Superior a very surprising one, uh, and one where we are really still in the early stages of our understanding. Um, so we'll try to bring you up to date on what we know about it so far, and uh, try to address um, the state of the science and also the, um, the aspects of this water quality issue, which are likely to be of the largest public concern. Um, besides myself, uh, three others, have contributed substantially to this presentation and to this work in general. And you'll hear from two of them. Uh, Brenda LaFrancois from the National Park Service is a, a really important partner with us in this work. And uh, many of the photographs and some of the slides you'll see come from her, but um, she's probably not going to be an active audio slash video participant today. Um, and so we might, we might see her as a, as a viewer, um, but thanks to Brenda for what she's done. Todd Miller from UW-Milwaukee will be presenting uh, uh, briefly during this presentation on what we know about toxins in the harmful algal blooms in Lake Superior. And Matt Hudson from Northland College will also be talking for a bit about what they've been doing in the Shawamigan Bay area. So I will be doing most of the talking, but we'll turn it over to my colleagues at different points. Um, so there was a really nice opening presentation today uh, about the Great Lakes as one of the great waters um, of Wisconsin. Um, many people I'm sure are already aware of the uh, amazing facts and figures about the amount of water um, and the land cover that the Great Lakes represent. Um, 244,000 square kilometers. Um, that makes it the largest single freshwater system on earth. And the Great Lakes hold a remarkable 84% of North America's surface fresh water. Um, and the region's home to more than 30 million people, which comes out to be roughly 10% of the US and 30% of Canada's populations. So that's Great Lakes as a whole. And this topic about Lake Superior Habs obviously ties in to a much broader perspective about HABs in the Great Lakes region uh, in general, but we will be focusing on Lake Superior. Um, the, the range of trophic states or water quality across the Great Lakes is, is really quite amazing. Uh, this is kind of a heat map uh, presentation of both the phosphorus 
delivery from the land to the lakes. Uh, so in the watershed, the darker hues of green indicate more phosphorus coming off the landscape. And in the lakes themselves, the warmer colors indicate higher levels of total phosphorus, which of course is a main driver of trophic state in lakes. Um, and you can see the region we're talking about uh, and Lake Superior in general tends to be low in total phosphorus as is Lake Huron, uh, but uh, Lake Michigan's uh, higher, especially in the Green Bay area, Saginaw Bay and the uh, really the biggest tabs problem across the Great Lakes is in Lake Erie. So we try to keep this perspective of all the Great Lakes in mind when we're thinking about these surprising events we see in Lake Superior. Um, that range in phosphorus concentrations across the Great Lakes leads to a really wide range of water quality conditions from the turbid state typically of Lake Erie uh, to the typical clear state of Lake Superior. Um, so that's, that's the stage on which this work is set. Um, getting a little closer to home here, here's Wisconsin uh, and indicating the portions of the state which are in the Great Lakes watershed. Um, Wisconsin, if you didn't know already, has more than a thousand miles of Great Lakes shoreline. About 20% of its land area is within the Great Lakes. Um, and what we're going to be doing is traveling up to this portion right here. So we will be talking about the Wisconsin shoreline from the twin ports of Duluth and Superior around the Bayfield Peninsula um, and then down into uh, the Shawamigan Bay area. So this is the portion of the lake that uh, we will be discussing today. Um, reminder again, this is really kind of why this is such a fascinating scientific story and such a surprising public interest story. The waters of Lake Superior are legendary for being cold and clear and transparent and um, people come for from miles uh, in order to have that experience of such a vast quantity of amazingly clear water. Uh, this is the National Park Service area around the Bayfield Peninsula, typically. Um, however, we have seen these events, these brief events, um, localized to the near shore. We'll have more information about those specifics in a minute. Um, when the lake looks more like this, this is Lake Superior. Um, in a state that most people don't think about Lake Superior being in. Um, this is a recreational kayaker in the uh, Apostle Islands region, and the water looks more like an Iowa farm pond. Uh, nothing against Iowa, um, but the water looks more like an Iowa farm pond than it does Lake Superior. And so if you haven't yet encountered this amazing thing that Lake Superior occasionally turns really thick, opaque green. This is what we're here to talk about. And one of the first questions that comes up and one of the main questions we are trying to address is, is this really a new thing? Has Lake Superior entered some kind of a new environmental state where these HABs are now occasionally, but um, uh, uh, yeah, occasionally, but uh, consistently um, into the future. That is, is, are these occasional cyanobacteria blooms something we can expect to see into the future? Um, and um, that's what we're trying to understand right now. The question of when did they start is a tough one for us to address um, because we don't have good quality data going back many years in this particular near shore zone of Lake Superior. There has been monitoring of the offshore of Lake Superior for years now, um, but these blooms are near shore phenomena and we simply can't go to any particular database to see whether these things have happened much in the past. Um, we think, um, so here's another image of what Lake Superior looks like when it turns green. Believe it or not, that's Lake Superior right there. Um, and we have seen multiple instances of this in the last 10 years. 
Um, there are a few historical references to what people have referred to as green water, um, but these are, um, there's nothing more to go on than those statements. Uh, we don't know the nature of that green water. In fact, if it was even algae, uh, there are no samples, there's no data. So there is the possibility that Lake Superior has done this for a long time, but we doubt it. Um, the reason we doubt it is the human attention paid to Lake Superior is very high. Um, recreational users, are, especially around the national park, are very intent on uh, observing the lake. Um, the National Park Service is right there with staff and biologists. Um, there are more than 100 water quality professionals just in the Duluth Superior region alone. And so we think that um, given those circumstances, if Lake Superior had been turning green for many, many years occasionally, uh, we would have known it, but we cannot prove that at this point. So we think they're new, but we can't, we can't prove that. Um, the story about the cyanobacteria blooms in Lake Superior, I guess really starts in 2012 which uh, for us here in the Duluth Superior region immediately reminds us of this incredibly intense rainstorm, which occurred in June, June 19 and 20 of that year, when um, what was um, the annual exceedance probability here reported by the National Weather Service exceeded, you can probably not read this very well, but it was more than a, a 500 year event. Um, this was the famous event when a lot of infrastructure was ripped up in the Twin Ports and zoo animals were wandering around town. And um, it, was, um, it was an event that was uh, recorded uh, many, in, in many ways through the news services. Uh, so that rain event happened in June of 2012. And then in July of 2012, mid-July, across about 20 kilometers of shoreline from Cornucopia to Little Sand Bay. So I mean, kind of roughly in this region of the, of the lake shore, um, a, a, a cyanobacteria bloom was observed, was sampled. Um, and so there is no doubt that cyanobacteria bloom occurred uh, over a reasonably long stretch of the shoreline in 2012. Uh, Lake Superior blooms then also have been observed in a few other years. I'll talk a little bit more about that near the end, um, but smaller, like one bay, uh, one day, uh, a very noticeable cyanobacterial scum. Um, so we're seeing these little flare ups um, uh, in some years. Then the really um, the event which really got our attention was in 2018, and we realized that there was something going on here. Um, the first sign of trouble was in August 9 of 2018, when um, green water and uh, algae populations were reported to the national parks. My lab scrambled into action, and we began our sampling of the, this event the next day. Um, Brenda, who I introduced at the beginning, was out there um, and she captured this image of Lake Superior. And that's just a simple grab sample, just dipping this empty bottle into the lake and pulling it up. You can see how green it was. This event lasted several days, maybe a week on the outside. Um, uh, and it was, um, there were observations similar to this photograph across a hundred kilometers of the shoreline. That's basically all the way from the Twin Ports around to the uh, tip of the Bayfield Peninsula. Um, so suddenly Lake Superior as observed from the shore became this thick opaque green for several days to a week, let's say. It's variable uh, different places exactly in the shoreline, but that's the uh, order of magnitude of the spatial and temporal aspects of this 2018 bloom, which is the largest bloom so far. 
Um, seeing something like this happen in Lake Superior because of Lake Superior's reputation became a very big news story. And so we had coverage in the New York Times, both Minnesota Public Radio, Wisconsin Public Radio, many print and television outlets wanted to know what was going on. We were, we were pretty busy doing science and public outreach for this period of time in 2018. This map kind of summarizes what I've just described to you ver uh, verbally um, with different years color coded in different ways down here in the legend. The red indicates 2018 observations, which stretch all the way basically across the whole shoreline. Uh, smaller um, events um, in earlier years. So, you, but you can get a sense of what part of the shoreline we're talking about here. Uh, for the science geeky types out there in the crowd, this is the algae that is um, of concern, um, at least outside of Shawamigan Bay, and Matt Hudson will tell us more about that, but uh, outside of Shawamigan Bay, the cyanobacteria blooms that have been observed in Lake Superior have all been this one species of algae, uh, Dolichospermum lemmermanii, um, and it forms these colonies. It has these specialized cells that are called heterocysts and achinides. So it's, it's kind of a complex organism as far as cyanobacteria go, um, and it floats. And so that's, uh, that's a big part of the story here is the blue-greens are floating to the surface and washing to shore. But you can see 2012, 16, 17, 18, all basically the same type of algae that um, is, gonna, is being observed out there. Um, it's very difficult for us to say much about spatial extent, um, partly because sampling has been limited. Uh, satellite observations often can be very helpful in circumstances like this, but satellite imagery of the near shore of this part of the lake is very complex, complex actually, where you see a lot of sediment resuspension and colored water ranging from brownish to greenish um, very often. And so it is no simple feat to go back, say, to satellite imagery and determine when there was a bloom and when there wasn't. We have tried. Uh, that nut may be cracked at some point, but it's, it's difficult for us to say. But this image, which was taken during the height of the 2018 bloom, I have pretty high confidence we are really truly looking at uh, a Habs bloom in Lake Superior here. Um, the colors, of course, have been enhanced a little bit. But you can see along the shoreline here this bright green uh, with some entrainment offshore. And so I believe we are looking at a blue green algae bloom here and not sediment. Um, and this uh, slide really points out how near shore we are really talking here. These blooms are um, less than two kilometers wide uh, along the shoreline, something more like half a kilometer typically during the height of this bloom. So it's truly a near shore phenomenon. That said, these people don't care a whole lot what's going on a kilometer or more away their experience of lake at that shoreline, that narrow strip where we see these blooms is where all the people are. And so um, one might say from a kind of unattached scientific perspective, these events are pretty minor because they uh, are only occurring in a very small fraction of Lake Superior's water. Um, that very small fraction of Lake Superior's water is exactly where people experience the lake. So there is certainly a big social amplifier here where these, these HABs are uh, much more significant to people than they would be otherwise. And so that's the point I'll just, I'll, uh, I'll make right now in a different way. Um, what worries me the most right now about these blooms is what it might do to the rep, uh, reputation of the Lake Superior resource. 
I sometimes think about people who have maybe plan for a year for a kayak trip on Lake Superior and they get their boats off their cars after a long drive and they walk up to the lake and there is this green water. That's not what they came for. Um, and so um, is it possible that we are in the early years of some um, kind of state change about Lake Superior where blooms will become regular enough that people integrate that into their mental image of the lake and will it detract from um, the um, attraction that Lake Superior has for a, a recreational destination? I don't know, but it is one of my really big concerns. So I'm gonna turn the audio now over to Todd Miller and he will walk you through what we know so far about toxins. Thanks, Bob. Um... So the main species then responsible for these blooms, as Bob mentioned, is uh, Dolichospermum. And unfortunately, there are a number of uh, acutely acting uh, toxins associated with this species of algae. Um, so there's per peripheral nerve toxins, uh, anatoxin A, guanatoxin, both activate smooth muscle and can cause convulsions. Saxitoxin, otherwise known as paralytic shellfish poisoning, oftentimes associated with uh, marine environments, but there are freshwater Dolichospermum species that make this toxin, and this inhibits smooth muscle causing paralysis. And there's been a number of dog deaths associated with these um, molecules. Uh, in marine environments, many uh, human poisoning cases of saxitoxin uh, but in, in all the cases with peripheral nerve toxins, um, if enough is consumed, uh, can cause death by uh, respiratory, uh, sorry, asphyx asphyxiation. Um, probably maybe the more prevalent of the toxins are the microcystins, um, which are found globally. These cause death of liver cells, resulting in uh, liver necrosis. Um, chronic long-term exposure, so we're talking about potentially entering drinking water, um, that, that's been associated with liver and colorectal cancer uh, in some areas through epidemiological studies. Nodularin, um, often more associated with uh, brackish lakes, but actually has been found in benthic uh, species of freshwater algae as well, um, also a, a liver toxin. And then the other one is commonly associated with dolichospermum is cylindrospermopsin, which hits multiple organs. It inhibits protein synthesis and causes liver and kidney necrosis. I guess maybe the good thing is, is that so far we have not detected any of these usual uh, algal toxins, either in Lake Superior blooms or in the Dolichospermum species that have been isolated uh, from those blooms. So that's a really good thing. However, this is a new species and um, there's many other potential compounds that it could make. So don't you advance to the next slide, Bob? So in many ways, us scientists, particularly chemists, think of cyanobacteria uh, as little chemical factories or pharmaceutical factories. A number of compounds have been isolated from freshwater cyanobacteria as well as marine cyanobacteria that affect mammalian physiology in some way or that would be useful uh, in medicine. So we have a bunch of antibacterial, antifungal compounds, um, and then some compounds that are mildly cytotoxic that would kill, for example, human cancer cells. Um, so just a, a whole plethora of different compounds that have been isolated uh, from both freshwater and marine cyanobacteria that at one time we thought could be useful in medicine. And some of them have made, found their way into uh, you know, a marketed pharmaceutical compound but others, you know, for example, some compounds that were potentially useful as antibiotics, um, you know, may have inhibited, inhibited bacterial growth, but were too toxic to use as medicines in humans. And some of them we found now to be toxic to fish or other animals in aquatic environments. And this may contribute to uh, habitat degradation, um, in some cases leading to poor fish reproduction. And we're not done. So with a new species like this in Lake Superior, there's great potential 
to discover many new compounds, uh, some of which may be toxic. But of those compounds that you know, we had looked at originally uh, may be useful in medicine, we now know are toxic to other organisms. We did find one of those in Lake Superior blooms uh, and del the del Dolichospermum species that were isolated from those blooms. You can advance to the next slide, Bob. So uh, if there's any chemists in the room, that's the structure of this compound. It's called an anabana peptin. And we detected it, as I said, both in the bloom and in a cultured species of delicospermum that was isolated from those blooms. Originally isolated because we thought maybe it'd be useful in medicine, but we now know that it's highly toxic to crustaceans, worms, and affects fish reproduction. And we also know now that it has a similar mode of action to the uh, usual liver toxins associated with freshwater algae, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, the microcystins. We don't really know yet um, whether they're toxic to humans or at what level they would be toxic to humans. We just haven't done those uh, kinds of studies yet. But, but if, if they're to toxic to crustacean worms and fish, there's a potential for uh, significant changes in, in habitat and potentially fish reproduction. There's also a theory about another ecological role for anabana peptins because uh, we know that they inhibit digestive enzymes of zooplankton. So the theory is that potentially uh, cyanobacteria make these compounds so that they would uh, essentially pass through the guts of their predators, zooplankton, uh, without being digested. So we're learning a lot. Um, we have a lot of more toxicology type studies to do on both bloom samples and the cultured species. And while these are un unfortunate events uh, for somebody like myself, this is um, intriguing. And um, hopefully we'll learn a lot more about the chemistry and toxicity of these blooms uh, going forward. Thanks, Bob. Great, thanks, Todd. Um, okay, so we're going to move now into um, some more details about the science so far that we've been able to do on these blooms. Um, and one of the points we can start with here is um, in terms of the landscape that feeds into Lake Superior and this part of the lake. Um, many of you probably are aware that it's a very um, well, it's a relatively low human population that's um, dispersed throughout this part of the watershed, small towns, um, and uh, the majority of the landscape, 70% or more is forest. Um, urban land is, um, you know, a percent or less uh, in this area. And relative to cyanobacteria blooms, we always look for, um, could there be some agricultural uh, release of nutrients that are causing these. And it may be a factor, but um, the majority of agricultural land in this part of the watershed is pasture or hay. And we don't typically think of that as an important nutrient source. Um, cultivated crops is something less than 1% of the landscape. So not to say that there, uh, that human sort of direct release of nutrients is zero or unimportant, but it doesn't immediately jump out at us like um, in other parts of the Great Lakes or around the world where there's a tremendous amount of nutrients coming from agriculture. So urban and agricultural lands have only a small footprint here. Um, but the watershed might be important for other reasons. And um, here I wanna tell you about PhD work that's being done in my lab by Kate Reinel uh, who's um, been uh, really involved in this problem for uh, several years now. And part of her work was a culture study um, where she took lake or river water from different locations around this region, brought that water into the lab and put the, the algae that were harvested from nature that way into conditions that we knew were conducive to cyanobacteria growth. So we basically brought algae from the world into our lab, 
gave them all the opportunity in the world for them to grow and monitored which locations uh, were more likely to produce cyanobacteria than others. Long story short, um, the parts of the land of the entire watershed, including the lake, which uh, resulted in cyanobacteria growth was mostly uh, rivers and the harbor. Um, we basically never got growth, uh, substantial growth from the lake itself. And um, in a follow-up study, Kate looked at a number of different uh, river and stream systems throughout Wisconsin here. And the color here indicates the, how fast cyanobacteria grew, where the uh, dark uh, blue colors here indicate the most rapid growth. And so um, what we are thinking based on these results is the landscape uh, isn't just a source of nutrients, but it actually is a source of the cyanobacteria themselves uh, in terms of propagules. So potentially these big rainstorms that we just began to talk about or other events are washing the algae from the land into the lake uh, to trigger a bloom to form. Um, we have some understanding of what parts of the landscape, what characteristics of the landscape make one place a little more prone to um, growing cyanobacteria than others, but um, this work is still in development. Um, parts of the landscape where there's a high conductivity in the water, which is a measure of ions, uh, and um, paradoxically enough, I won't explain this because we don't have time, but uh, parts of the lake or parts of the watershed which themselves are cooler um, also seem to be places to promote cyanobacteria blooms. So bottom line, we can't identify one single spot in the landscape, um, but we are beginning to understand some locations as being more important than others in terms of potentially triggering a bloom. Um, and so that's a good way, uh, a good uh, place now to turn over to Matt Hudson from Northland College, who has done some similar work. Matt, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so I'm Matt Hudson. I'm uh, Associate Director and Water Scientist with uh, Mary Griggs Berg Center for Freshwater Innovation, which is at Northland College in Ashland, Wisconsin. And so I'm going to talk real briefly here about um, some work that uh, myself and Matt Cooper and Desi Nowinski here at, at Northland, and as well as our, uh, we have a, a crew of undergraduate researchers that are, are working with us on, on this project and others. Uh, Olivia Anderson, Ella Shively, Stephanie Wright, Cole Gass, and Jordan Bremer have all contributed to this. You see this, this um, figure here that Bob showed earlier from, it's from Brenda uh, LeFrancois, that shows uh, the observations of blooms that have occurred um, to date. And so uh, you'll notice I, I've got the, the Schwamigan Bay area circled there for those that aren't familiar with, with the region. And you'll note there was one red dot that showed up in 2018. There was a, a boater report of a small bloom between uh, Long Island and Madeline Island, so just outside of Schwamigan Bay. But outside of that, um, the Schwamigan Bay region hasn't experienced any observed or documented uh, blue-green algae blooms to date. And uh, when you think about areas of the, the South Shore of Lake Superior that might be susceptible to a bloom, um, Schwamigan Bay really pops out because it's fairly isolated from the rest of Lake Superior. It's got the urban areas of Ashland and Washburn, and it's also very shallow um, and, and gets pretty warm. Uh, along with that, we have one of the higher concentrations of agricultural land use um, in, in the Lake Superior Basin occurs uh, in areas that drain to Shawamiga Bay. So in terms of areas of the lake that might be susceptible, Shawamiga Bay seems to pop out as, as one of those, yet we haven't seen blooms here to date. So uh, our big question is why and what is the risk of blooms in the Shawamiga Bay region? So uh, if you want to move to the next slide, Bob. So we set out uh, in 2019 uh, with significant help from Bob and Kate Reinel um, to basically replicate the, a lot of the experimental approach that Kate used to look for potential source areas for blooms along the south shore of the lake. And we applied that to the Schwamigan Bay region. Um, 
So in August and September of 2019, we ran a couple of culturing experiments where we concentrated algae from the water column and the sediment surface, uh, same as Kate did from uh, in the, the triangles there on the map, the uh, tributary locations. And we also looked at a series of estuaries of the of those tributaries where they where they drain into Schwamiga Bay or the Schwamiga Bay region. So that's Bad River, Fish Creek, and the Sioux River for those familiar with the geography. And then we also looked at uh, in the yellow X's uh, from the lake itself again. Um, so this is sort of the, the broad scale survey to see uh, what we can get to grow and, fr and from where. And so we looked at uh, two temperatures, a high and low temperature, as well as a high and low uh, nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. So basically, um, one of our approaches more more limiting to growth and the other one giving them everything that, that they should need to grow. Um, so next slide, Bob, we'll talk about the results. And then if you can um, hit the advanced button a couple, there you go. So our results, what you're looking at here in these two graphs are um, the growth response in our cultures over time. So growth response being measured by chlorophyll A using an instrument called the phytopam. And so uh, it was just the estuary cultures that showed any blue-green algal response uh, in both of our experiments in 2019. Uh, the tributary cultures did not show any growth, nor did the lake. So similar to what Bob and Kate found in that there appears to be uh, more of a land to lake connection here with the estuary cultures having the, the response and nothing actually responding from the, from the lake itself. But one of the really interesting things we found was that um, we did find uh, two species of Dolichospermum that were the blue-green algae, uh, but they were uh, Flossicoe and Delicatulum more associated with eutrophic environments. We did not identify any of the Lemmermanii species, which is what has been detected in the, in the blooms and in the experimental work that Kate and Bob have been doing to this point. So that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, development. We, we did run another smaller experiment this past summer um, and, and we did not find any Lemmermania in that, that uh, work as well. But this, this coming year, and Bob's gonna talk a little bit more about this in, in detail later on, but um, we're gonna try to really get at that question of is Schwamiga Bay really, is that region really different? Is there something different going on on this side of the Bayfield Peninsula? We'll be looking at a little more detail in some of the coastal areas around the bay to, to hone in on potential propagule source areas. Um, and then also hoping to link with some some larger efforts going on uh, to look at uh, DNA sequencing techniques to, to see if we can hone in a little bit more on 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 the detail of the microbial community in the Schwamiga Bay area uh, compared to other areas of, of the south shore of the lake. So that's all I have, Bob. I can turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Matt. So um, we're going to finish now with a small series of slides about why Lake Superior may be doing this now and wasn't doing it before. Um, and the science we have developed so far is pretty strongly pointing toward climate as an important driver here. Uh, climate both in the temperature, temperature sense and in the precipitation sense, the rainfall sense. Uh, and we'll show you why we think that now. Um, the point I want to make at the outset of this part of the uh, presentation is that um, Lake Superior has a very well-deserved reputation for being pristine and less uh, altered by human activities than uh, most other parts in the Great Lakes are. But in the sense of climate change, Lake Superior is probably more subjected to anthropogenic change than the other lakes are. That is, it's not as hammered by humans uh, in most respects, but in the sense of climate change, it might be the leading of the Great Lakes in terms of impact um, uh, on climate. I'll explain why I say that here in a second. Um, basically, um, when one looks across many lakes around the world, many of them are warming and Lake Superior is one of the most rapidly warming lakes on the planet in the sense of peak summer surface temperature. 
not average temperature around the year or average temperature through the whole water column, but how warm does the surface layer get in a given year? That variable is warming very quickly. And here is uh, kind of a range uh, globally of rates of warming. And E and C here are the eastern and central buoys uh, of Lake Superior. So Lake Superior is in the upper end of this range globally. Um, don't have time, this is really fascinating science, but the reason that can be has more to do with the timing of stratification than anything else. And so coming out of a cold, say high ice year, the lake takes a very long time to warm up and doesn't really hit four degrees centigrade, which is an important benchmark until in this extreme case, August, whereas a milder winter, low ice, the lake hits that four degree point uh, in June. And so because the lake has a much longer time to warm up in a warm year than it does in a cold year, the peak temperature it can reach in a given year is very much controlled by when the lake stratifies. And so this is a kind of a climate amplifier, which makes Lake Superior uh, much more climate sensitive than the other lakes are. Um, so here's, and we all are aware, the earth is warming, uh, this region of the world is warming. Um, and so as we kind of look at this kind of upper US Midwest region, um, the Northern parts of that are warming faster than the Southern parts. So Lake Superior is in an area where the climate itself is warming very rapidly. It's also the case that um, many places in the uh, US Midwest are experiencing increasing uh, frequency of really extreme rain events. Uh, here, uh, this data is, uh, is suggesting that increase is higher in the Eastern part of Lake Superior than in the West. But overall, we're still seeing a, a shift in pattern of rainfall. And so Lake Superior may offer us the best chance to record, quote, pure climate effects on lakes as almost anywhere on the planet because climate is um, very important in Lake Superior and other things like nutrient runoff or invasive species certainly are factors, but are less uh, important factors in Lake Superior than elsewhere. Okay, so now this graph shows uh, the important findings relative to temperature. And what we have here is each series of dots here is a different year. This is degree days. So every temperature in a given day adds to the degree days for that year. So it's a cumulative measure. And the gray tracings here are years when no cyanobacterial bloom was reported anywhere in Lake Superior. And the colored tracings are years when cyanobacterial blooms were reported with 2012 and 2018 being the largest of the events so far, they are in red. And you can see the red and blue tracings lie in the upper end of this range, whereas the gray tracings lie on the lower end of this range. So in simple, language terms here, um, blooms have occurred in the warmest years um, from a seasonal standpoint. Um, this one was interesting, this, uh, well, what year was this? Now I've forgotten. This year started out very warm, but then there was an unusual cold period in the summer. Um, and so in the beginning part of the typical bloom season, this year started out warm, but ended up cold. Um, so um, maybe it's not a perfect correlation between temperature and blooms, but it's a pretty suggestive correlation. And temperature is only part of the climate story. As I mentioned, uh, frequency and in fact, extent of uh, mega storm events, uh, extreme storm events are changing too. And so here's a photograph taken during uh, or shortly after one of the really large rain events in recent years in this part of the Lake Superior watershed. This rather busy slide uh, is showing you a variety of uh, 
strings of data about water. And so the upper graph is precipitation. Um, and then we have the flow of the Namaji, the flow of the Brule, and the flow of the Whittlesey Creek. And the main points to take home from here are that the 2012 June storm that ripped up parts of Duluth and Superior, and also uh, the major rainstorm of 2018 were the two largest precipitation events in recent years. Those happened to be the years when we saw substantial cyanobacteria blooms in Lake Superior. So it's a pretty convincing, I think, but circumstantial case that precipitation is a factor here. Especially that 2018 rainfall event uh, was really centered in such a way that uh, the Namaji and the Brule and even Whittlesey Creek uh, in this run of data, that 2018, the largest bloom year so far in Lake Superior, were the largest precipitation events going back through this string of data. So again, circumstantial, but blooms have happened in warm years and big blooms have happened in years of extreme rainfall event. So here's a, you saw this already. This is the 2018 rainfall event that I just mentioned showing again, very long exceedance probabilities in this part of the watershed. Um, and so no two rainstorms are alike. The 2012 one was concentrated in this part of the watershed. The 2018 was more uh, kind of stretched out through the whole um, stretch of watershed. Uh, but these were the two really sort of historically large precipitation events that we've seen in recent years. Um, I'll just briefly mention here that we do have data on um, nutrients that are coming off the land. Um, I've sort of de-emphasized the role of nutrients here, but um, those blooms have to get their nutrients from somewhere. And um, the, the uh, large rainfall events likely are very important in terms of bringing algae into the lake, but they certainly also bring nutrients. And so here is a graph of the nitrogen and the phosphorus concentration in the Brule River, which is gauged by the USGS. So we have flow data. And you can see that uh, in most respects, higher flow means higher nutrient concentration. The really big 2018 flood is weird in ways we don't quite understand yet. Um, but when you have these uh, rainstorms, they're bringing more into the land just because there's more water flow, but they're also bringing more into the lake from the land because of high erosion and they're carrying more nutrients uh, at high flow than at low flow. Um, we're trying to understand the lags. So if it's true that mega rainstorm events are driving these blooms, um, they're not doing it immediately. There's a several week to more than one month lag between the historically large rainfalls and when we observe blue-green blooms in the lake. Um, that lag may be because it just takes time for the algae to grow. Uh, takes a while for the lake to warm up. Um, on the other hand, there may be something more interesting and complicated going on there that has to do with the, the uh, nature of the material that's washing into the lake. So after a big rainstorm event, the lake tends to look like this picture. Um, and all of that brown sediment has nutrients, but the nutrients, at least the phosphorus, is tightly bound to that sediment. And it may take some time also for the nutrients to go from sediment to algae. And that's something that we're following up on now. My current master's student, Tesha Coker, uh, is, is doing a, a detailed study of the uh, transfer of nutrients from sediment that washes from the la uh, land into the lake, the transfer of that into algae. That's a part of the story that we're just beginning to uh, untangle now. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up uh, with, a I can't remember, a couple more slides, but not too many more. Um, I wanna point out that the International Joint Commission, uh, just in the last few months, 
released what they referred to as their second triennial assessment of progress report. So something they only do every three years. And within that second triennial assessment of progress report, there were three recommendations by the International Joint Commission, a binational body that is um, paying careful attention to the lakes and has some legal uh, requirements to, to help both Canada and the US protect this resource. Of the three recommendations that the IJC put out uh, in 2020, number two referred entirely to climate change and nutrients on Lake Superior. So the IJC really elevated this problem to, um, to high priority in its view, and they're suggesting uh, these four I numbered items here about characterizing loads and improving understanding, uh, being precautionary about management, um, and um, uh, move more science into management. So um, bravo to the IJC. We were, um, we're sad to see this happen to the lake, but we're encouraged that it's starting to get some of the attention that it is. So we gave you a lot of information. The conclusions, the things to remember for a long time about Lake Superior blooms. They are episodic, but they are recurring. Uh, we think they're new. Um, we think the upland that is the landscape that washes into the lake is important both because of living cells that are coming from the landscape and because of the nutrients that wash in. We strongly think that climate is a major driver here and could be why Lake Superior is entering this new ecological phase because it's starting to show the strains of climate change. What's going to happen in the future? We're trying to understand that. We have limited ability to project into the future, but simplistically we could say that until uh, the world gets a hold of climate change as a problem, we might be living in this sort of, I hate to use the word new normal, it's a controversial term, but um, uh, if all of these uh, suppositions that we've made so far are true, uh, that climate is causing Lake Superior to do this, uh, it's hard to see a future um, in a warmer, stormier world where this isn't a continuing regular problem. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff to try to understand this better, more monitoring, more research. We're doing our best, like we are today, to uh, let a broad audience know about this problem in Lake Superior. Um, 2021 will be really exciting for us because uh, 2021 is Lake Superior's turn uh, to receive additional scrutiny by all the research agencies that work on the Great Lakes. So the five lakes are on a five-year cycle. Every year, it's a different lake's turn to get increased attention. And 2021 is a CSMI year, uh, which is Cooperative Science Monitoring Initiative. But it's a lot of agency work uh, will be added to the kinds of studies we've been doing in the past uh, to try to understand, help us understand this near shore zone. Larger lessons, and I promise this is it. Uh, Lake Superior is not immune from detrimental change. It has a well-deserved reputation for being pristine, but that doesn't mean it's um, immune from harm. I wanna say that uh, this is not what should be happening if we were truly restoring the Great Lakes. And I think GLRI is a magnificent set of projects. It's a magnificent program. It's done a lot of good. Uh, the focus on restoration is the right focus. Um, but if we were restoring the Great Lakes, we wouldn't be seeing new big problems like this. And so the work is far from done. Um, I wanna point out that we didn't see this coming. Um, the 2012 bloom was a big shock. The 2018 largest bloom was another big shock. We just didn't expect Lake Superior to do this. 
It's also true no one expected Lake Erie to do what it's doing now since the mid 90s with these cyanobacteria blooms in Lake Erie. So we really have very limited ability to anticipate future change. That points out the gaps we have in our monitoring and our knowledge. And I guess I'll close with uh, one more underscoring of what we see so far in the science is that climate change is a really important driver here. So um, we probably have some ability to control nutrients off the landscape or control the status of the near shore so we don't create the propagules. Um, I don't wanna say there's nothing we can do, but um, I think we also have to recognize that unless we get our hands on climate change as a global problem, we're gonna, we're sort of making it harder and harder on ourselves to control these local issues. So um, Lake Superior's reputation is a good one. I hope it continues to be a good one, it should, but we have this sort of black mark now. Uh, we have these events where um, it is not fulfilling people's expectations for the high quality resource that it should and could be. So that's it. Uh, I've got a slide here with some references for those who wanna do more reading. And I will end now, and I hope we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, we do. We still have about five minutes for questions. Um, thanks, Bob, Todd, Matt, Brenda, so much for the really fascinating presentation. I might be a little biased because I work and live on Lake Superior, but um, I think there's been a lot of great interaction in the Q&A that demonstrates in interest in the topic. So oh, um, there have been several questions that have been answered live, um, but I, I did see two new ones come in. Um, so one was... Um, related to low ice cover in 2012 and 2018, um, mm -hmm. were those blooms um, also low ice cover years? Yeah, uh, thanks for the great question. Um, well, this is, I said it's hard to predict the future, but we do have um, some ability to predict the coming year. And that is because the peak summer surface temperature is pretty strongly controlled by the temperature of the lake the winter before, uh, which relates to ice. So um, a low ice year, like this year will end up being, in spite of a brief, very cold two weeks that we had, um, will, will, will very likely mean a warmer lake than usual in the coming summer. And as we saw, warmer water temperature means higher probability of cyanobacteria blooms. So I believe there we do have some ability to sort of the winter before to say whether there's a strong or a weak likelihood of cyanobacteria blooms. And this coming year could be a big one. Great, thank you. Um... Another question that came in was, were there any blooms in other areas of the lake or was it just confined to the area that you've been talking about today? Oh yeah, that's also a great question. And I overlooked that um, in my presentation because I'm talking about what I know best. But there have been reports of uh, floating algae uh, in other parts of Lake Superior, uh, even in the east, the Canadian side in the east, um, there have been reports up around the Thunder Bay region. Um, they have not been worked on intensively like we've worked on the South Shore, but it is true that um, similar kind of floating algal scum uh, phenomena have occurred um, in other regions of Lake Superior. I'm glad someone asked. Great, thanks. Um, a two-parter question. Uh, the first part is, what do you mean by propagule? Propagules. Sorry, I'm pronouncing that wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I mean, they're like seeds. They are the cells from which the population grows, and so they're, they're nothing more than live. In this case, Dolichospermum cells that um, are the initial cells which get the bloom started. So. We don't mean necessarily a specialized cell, although these cyanobacteria do have akinetes, so we're investigating those too. Um, but any kind of a living Dolichospermum cell could be a propagule. 
Great, thanks. And then, um, do you have any idea if there is a role played in the occurrence in the occurrence or intensity of blooms based on the type of P? I'm, I'm assuming they mean phosphorus. Could you repeat that? I didn't quite catch the. Yeah. Um, is there? Do you have any idea if there is a role played in the occurrence or intensity of blooms based on the type of P phosphorus? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Type of phosphorus. Um, we have suspicions. Um, but that is one of the things we are looking at most intently now uh, in my group and in cooperation with Matt. Um, so yeah, let's see, how can I answer that succinctly? What, what we know for sure is that most of the phosphorus coming off of the land is tightly bound to minerals. Um, our measurements suggest that the phosphorus coming into the lake from the land is more tightly bound to minerals than the phosphorus is from agricultural zones or other parts of Great Lakes. So we think pretty strongly that um, we're dealing with a mineralogical phenomenon here that um, makes Lake Superior somewhat different than the rest of the Great Lakes. Now, could 2012 and 2018 be different partly because of the type of phosphorus that either entered the lake or came into the lake. I will, sure, uh, I don't have any real specific findings to help address that, but I think it's a really interesting question. Great, thank you so much. Okay, it looks like we're at time, so I'm sorry if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, but I'm sure the presenters would be happy to answer it if you wanna reach out. Uh, by email. Um, so we're gonna now go into a break, but uh, a reminder that the morning plenary, talking climate, why facts are not enough with Catherine Hayhoe and Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes begins at 11 a.m. Uh, please don't forget to visit the exhibitor sponsor booths, participate in the Wisconsin Water Week challenges, vote in the photo contest, et cetera, um, all of which you can find in Event Moby. And thanks again to our speakers and everyone in the audience for a great panel discussion. Uh, we'll see you soon.